Hello and welcome to the Full-Time Creator Podcast, where you'll get wisdom, tips, and inspiration from creators building their dream businesses. I'm your host, Zach Swinehart, and today I'm here with John Ainsworth, and I am so, so, so excited for this episode. He is the CEO and founder of datadrivenmarketing.co. They help online course creators increase revenue by 4.6x on average, and he's the host of the Art of Selling Online Courses podcast, had to make sure I'm exactly quoted the name, uh, where they basically interview both successful course creators and they have kind of like uh, expert tactical guides from John and his team at the agency where they teach you a bunch of different strategies. I was just earlier today listening to a solo episode. I, th I think it was 101. I might be misquoting the number, but they had an episode on tripwire funnels and it was awesome. So after this, if you want one of his podcast episodes to listen to, listen to the one on tripwire funnels because it was great and it'll build on what we're going to talk about today. Um, so yeah, at Data Driven Marketing, they basically hone all stages of their client's funnels. And his coolest case study is pretty epic, which is that he has one course creator client who they brought from $3,000 a month to $200,000 a month in two years. But even cooler than that is that they got him from 3 k a month to 50 k a month within two months. And did you say they like never went below that? Am I never, they've never once gotten below it again. Wow. And to add to all this, we can add one other little bit of social proof, which is that he's a guest lecturer at Greenwich Business School and has been featured on Forbes. So with all that out of the way, John, hello, welcome. Thanks, Zach. Great to be here. So John and I were chatting a few minutes ago about the scope of the episode. And given the time of year, what we're thinking we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about Black Friday for just a couple minutes. Like um, the things that I really want to dive into are bundling thoughts that John might have and how to avoid like cannibalizing sales throughout the year um, when you promote at a discount on Black Friday. Uh, but what I really want to drive into today, which is the hook for the whole episode, is like, course creators, you're not promoting enough. John has this model that he's going to share with us today, which is essentially sending two promotions per month to your list, but not doing it in a way that feels spammy or like causes everyone to unsubscribe or whatever, like insert fear here. Um, so John, I guess with all of this laid out and Zach monologuing, um, what are some thoughts you have off the top of your head for like mistakes you see clients making with Black Friday or missed opportunities? Or what do you think a good Black Friday launch is in your mind? So a good Black Friday launch is not massively different to what the promotions can be during the rest of the year. So to, to look at it slightly different way to start with, most people do a Black Friday promotion. And one of the reasons they do it is because everybody else is running one as well and everybody feels comfortable about it. And that has pros and cons, right? It means that everybody does it. Everybody's in this mood for buying. So you've got that going on and you tend to have very high sales. But at the same time, it means that you're competing with everybody else running a promotion at exactly the same time as you are. And that if you look and do an audit of someone's sales, any course creator, you look at an audit of their sales and you'll see the spikes Black Friday is one of them. There's probably another one or two during the year, maybe when they do a launch, maybe it's their birthday or Independence Day or something like that. And the rest of the year tends to be quite flat. And the reason is because they're not doing email promotions the rest of the year. So the, the thing that we're going to come back to this, right, is you should be doing these email promotions all of the time. And I know that's going to bring people out in hives, but don't worry, it's all <laughs> going to be good. I'm going to explain why it's all right. I'm going to show you how to do it and how to do it in a way that makes you feel super comfortable and your audience loves. But the general framework and kind of the thing we're looking to do with Black Friday is you don't promote all of your courses at a massive discount all at once. This is the thing that nearly everybody does, right? They're like, okay, it's 50% off or 90% off or whatever the percentage is, right? Off of everything for the whole week. Now, the problem with that is everybody is then going to wait until Black Friday before they'll buy anything because they know that's when the biggest discount is. Like Digital Marketer does this, right? And it's tricky critiquing digital marketer because they do amazing work. But it, I I see it as no one's, everyone's like, well, I'm not going to spend a thousand bucks on this course because it's going to be a hundred bucks when it comes around to Black Friday. So what you can do instead is you can offer specific bundles every time you do Black Friday, like something that's on offer at a huge discount, but it does not have to be everything in your entire catalog, every single course that you've got available at that massive discount. Another way you can do it is you could do different things on different days. We had a client we did this with for a while. Where we did One day was one product, another day was another product. And that still means you're offering lots of different things, but it means that the audience doesn't feel like, 
oh, whatever it is, I can just wait till Black Friday. Because it might be the thing they're after isn't on sale then, so they should mm. still buy it some other point in the year when they're ready for it. What we generally do is make a specific bundle of like, okay, let me take a step back with pricing. Generally with email promotions, it's a really good idea to have something at least 99 bucks when it's on discount and probably more like around the 199 299 kind of mark. 199 seems to be a really good sweet spot. So what you can do is take a bundle of a bunch of things that might normally be 500 and then discount them down to 200 or 400 down to 200, something like that. And then you've got a big discount, but it's not on every single thing in your, in, that you're offering and it's in, done in a specific way. And that tends to lead to a big spike in sales without cannibalizing everything else that you're doing. So I raised my hand because one question I want to ask is like, suppose mm. somebody has a bunch of low ticket products. Like let's say that mm -hmm. they have full price products that are hundred bucks or 200 mm -hmm. bucks. Would you say that on Black Friday, the discount, like if they were going to do a discount as a standalone, it should be, well, I guess two questions. Number one, if they were to do a discount as standalone, would you say it should be something token like 10% or none at all? And then number two, would the main goal be that they wouldn't really be putting emphasis on selling that standalone and that it should always be part of a bigger bundle that is discounted to get the bundle price to the 200? Yes, the second one. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So... You want to have generally, when you're doing a promotion, you want to keep it really focused. And I feel like if you if you listen to the whole episode and you implement this and you've got promotions going for all different products throughout the year, then you don't have to have Black Friday be, right, this is my only chance to put everything on discount. And it's not and it's your only not your only chance to sell everything. So what we're looking at is maximizing your revenue over the year, not just maximizing your revenue for this one one week period, right? So we want to take a bunch of different things, put them together, that when it's discounted, uh, probably Black Friday discounts tend to be about 50%, right? That's that's a pretty solid one. Normal ones, maybe about 30% during the rest of the year. So you want like 400 bucks worth of stuff discounted down to about 200 or 300 down to 150 or whatever, right? Something in that kind of ballpark. And that's going to be about your sweet spot in terms of making the most sales. Love it. Is it I'm so selfishly asking you this because for my other business, I was planning <laughs> Black Friday today. Yeah. And I was obsessing all day. I was like, what am I going to do? And as of this sentence from John, I have now just crossed off all my plans and revised them because I was making that classic mistake. I was going to approach it like, okay, maybe for all the all the products, it's like 30% off, but then the big bundle is 50. But it sounds like in your mind, I guess I'll ask you a specific situation. Let's mm -hmm. say somebody has a flagship course. Yeah. And in the thread of cannibalization, especially if it's a cohort-based course, that's, I think, where most people are hesitant to discount because it's like discounting the most expensive thing. Um, whereas if you're bundling, then that adds the value and you're discounting like the bundle. So, but we'll let's yes hear Yes and no. I mean, like, because okay. whatever your, your flagship thing is, you, you want to be discounting that as well. So the, here's, okay. Robert Cialdini did this piece of research, this massive piece of research into the six different things that lead to people buying. It's called Influence is the book, I think. And he's got these six different things. See if I can, how many of them I can remember off the top of my head. One of them is reciprocity. Um, if you do stuff for somebody else, then they're more likely to do stuff for you. Another one is urgency slash scarcity. Another one is your credibility, like how how much of a authority figure you are in this space. And I'm going to see if I can remember the other three in a minute. But in the core space, urgency is really really vital you can use urgency or scarcity and i'll explain just very briefly the difference so that you know what that means so urgency is this discount's going to go away by the end of the week if you haven't bought by then then this is going to go back up to full price scarcity is there's only 100 of these available at this lower price or there's only 100 available at all you know so you might do that if you're doing a cohort based group coaching program something like that and in the course in the course space using urgency is the thing that works and I've seen people try and avoid it and say, I don't want to discount anything. I don't like this. I had a friend who every time I saw her at a conference, she would tell me, no, I'm not going to use discounts. I'm not going to use discounts. And then I talked to her um, like about a year ago and she said, oh, my, my sales have doubled. And I was like, that's amazing. What did you do? She's like, what I did is I raised my prices and then started doing discounts. So I was like, oh, huh. that was a clever idea. Where did you think <laughs> of that? You know, <laughs> it's just, this is what works. And yep. that's really important to kind of accept that and use that. And generally about 30% off is enough to give people the, the reason to take action now. So even on your flagship course, raise the price and then discount back down again. It's 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 what works. 
And I think I heard, um, so previous guest on the podcast, Jock Hopkins, I don't know if you know him. Yeah, he, Jack's amazing. Love him. Yeah. yeah. And he was saying, not on my interview with him, but another one, he was saying that like when he went from just evergreen, always the same price to deadline mm -hmm. funnel with, I think probably about 30%, I think he 10 x his uh, <laughs> his sales like overnight. Pretty yeah, nice. so there's a bunch of tactics, right? And if you do them all, you do really well. <laughs> it's like, there's not not like every tactic that exists out there. I don't mean like using sideways sales letters and, and evergreen webinars and like everything you could possibly do, but like having a discount and a guarantee and testimonials and like the, all the fundamentals of, of this whole process. If you do those, it works brilliantly. Yeah, Jack's, Jack uh, and I talked about that quite a lot. He came on my podcast, I've been on his and we, we've discussed it in detail and he's nice. he does a great job with his, yeah. Once you drink your water, if you want to drop an episode number, if you happen to have a photographic memory of your episode numbers, or I can just mark a cut and you Yeah, so work. Jack's been on episode 83 of The Art of Selling Online Courses. Cool. So, listener, go listen to that. And not episode until this 20. one's done. Okay, 83, <laughs> episode 20, after this episode. Yeah. So, let's chat a bit more on this discounting thing. I know I know. we said we move on, I'm looking at the clock. It's been about 10 minutes. We've got plenty of time for the other <laughs> thing. Um. So let's say you've got a thousand dollar course and you've yep. got a bunch of other bonuses. Maybe you've got a community you're going to bundle so that your, your total bundle value would have been like, let's say 2000, you're going to sell the whole thing for the thousand. So you're thus getting the same thousand you get if you sold the thousand dollar course. Number one, let's make sure you give the little check of approval on this so far. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So the question I would have is what if someone was like, well, I just want the, the course itself. On offer, do you offer that thousand dollar course like for say I don't know, eight hundred bucks, seven hundred bucks for Black Friday, or is it just? All right. So this yeah, is advanced tactics now, right? So here's what you do: is you set this up. If you want to do this as like a really big, so first of all, you don't have to. You can just keep it as straightforward, simple. Just have one offer. If you want to get advanced, then you, what you're going to do is run the promotion on the main offer for the Black Friday week, and then you offer a different offer for. Cyber Monday, which might be the downsell. So the concept of a downsell to explain is it's similar to the thing you were previously offering, but something smaller at a lower price. Or technically, it could also be um, a payment plan on the original thing. Either of those are, are ways of doing downsells. The payment plan, let's put that to one side for a minute and just focus on the a smaller version of it. So you could have Black Friday be we're going to just promote the um, the main offer plus all the bonuses, everything up to 2000 reduced down to 1000 And then Cyber Monday, you could do, not all of you wanted to spend all of that money and get the whole thing, so therefore we're doing this offer of just get the main course, and that's down to whatever price we put that at, let's say 600 And so you would, during the main Black Friday week, you would only offer the ability to buy that bundle. You wouldn't have the main course discount. Yeah, so this is the way that, that promotions work really well, is if you keep giving people different reasons to get the same thing. So people have, and we can get into the details of these, of, of all of these emails if you like, but like people have different ways of thinking, different ways of buying, different decision-making processes that they go through. We need to address all of those. If you were doing this one-on-one -on -one with somebody and you were really good at sales, you would figure out what is their decision-making process. Do they think logically? Do they think emotionally? Are they more interested in fear and avoiding stuff? Or are they more interested in moving towards some ambitious goal? And then you talk to them specifically about that. We're sending these emails out to thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. So we can't do that. We can't do this individual conversation. So what we've got to do instead is make sure we understand what's all the ways that our audience are thinking and address all of those. And you can't do that if you just keep jumping from one product to another product to another one. So what we want to do is is have all of those angles covered. And some, it's not like a, you know, nobody is just one or just another, but people tend to be more fear-based or more desire-based or more logic-based or what have you. So we want to have a series of emails that goes out that hit all of those different angles. Makes sense. So here I'll, I'll throw one more, which... I know this will count as an advanced one, but I'll throw one more at you before we move on from the Black Friday thing. So suppose you've got an email list. Again, this is me selfishly asking. Suppose you've mm -hmm. got an email list, list with a kind of beginner's segment mm -hmm. and a, an advanced segment, but you don't necessarily have super duper reliable segmentation data in advance yeah. to know who's in which one. And you like send a pre-Black Friday survey, again, coming from experience, um, to see, like, say, like, where are you at? Do you want the beginning one, the advanced one? And 
it comes to be sale time and there's somebody who you don't you don't know which one they're in would you a just throw one at them and you hope it's the right one or b throw both of these two offers that are very clearly like the beginner one the advanced one so to be clear are you sending a different sequence to the beginner people and to the advanced people if you know which segment they're in it'd have to be so i guess like if i make up an example like let's say that you've got i mean i guess i'll just give you the real one so it's for double your freelancing we've got one segment of the audience who is really interested in just like getting started as a freelancer mm -hmm. and then another segment of the audience wants to like productize scale build a marketing funnel so they're like yeah. very different bundles um so yeah so like I think that a lot of course creators would have this where they have their like main advanced thousand dollar program and then maybe their cheaper three hundred dollar one or whatever and the people who are in the beginner segment wouldn't want the thousand dollar one and the people in the advanced segment might have already taken i mean we would know if they took the cheaper one but yeah i'm just yeah. kind of curious like if somebody has two things they could promote would you rather see them just pick one and maybe be wrong or try to promote both alongside and each email yeah. would have to speak to who it's for or something pick one and maybe be wrong <laughs> okay so then it sounds like with that said your downsell approach is probably the way you'd recommend it which is main flagship offer that you think brings the biggest transformation that's the most expensive and then next week maybe the cheaper one yeah that would work that would work definitely what we did so we used to do a lot of segmentation and we've actually over time moved away from it because we kept finding that we were wrong <laughs> like so <laughs> you'd have a segment of like oh these guys are interested in google ads these ones are interested yeah. in facebook ads these ones are interested in funnels and never the twain shall meet. And it's like, it just, we were just wrong again and again, mm. because if you would send a promotion of the, of the, any one of those to everybody on the list, it kept being that people who weren't in that segment were buying. And we just kept finding this again and again. So for example, we've got um, a client who is uh, selling language learning courses. So there's A1, A2, B1, B2, et cetera, right? So at least that's the European model for doing it. A beginner, advanced, intermediate is like the um, American kind of description of the same thing. And she has managed to segment a bunch of people into what level they're at. But most people segment themselves incorrectly. And so it's often the case that a bunch of people should be buying the thing that they think is too low level for them there so we actually are managing to make a bunch of sales the b1 to people who are at the b2 level if you position it in the right way and we've got a bunch of challenges that she's got that are aimed at a specific level but we we kind of don't explain to everybody what level those ones are at and then people who are at a different level are buying them and they're super useful and it works really well and I just, I keep seeing this, right? We mm. keep being wrong about the segments and managing to segment people properly because we had all different clever ways we tried to do it. And we keep seeing that the stuff is useful for people who technically that shouldn't have been quite right for because they weren't in that segment. Now, there is a potential downside, which is people might unsubscribe because they're getting content that isn't relevant for them. So that is something that is to be cognizant of. It's something to be aware of. And if that really, really bothers you, then you can segment more and avoid sending those things out. But generally, that's not the way that we've been doing it. And we've actually seen it has not led to big unsubscribe rates. It's not that's not really a problem because we're sending out super valuable, useful content as part of the promotion. Um, and it allows you to say, right, well, we're going to do um, a wider range of promotions of all of these different courses. So that's that's been our experience with it, of, of what we found has worked. Cool. And so in that example where you mentioned that you had these three segments, mm -hmm. If you still believed in segmentation, then probably you would, I don't know, send a Black Friday campaign to each where you promote the thing you believe they would want. But now that you don't believe in segments, and this is going to probably tie into the rest of the episode, but I just want to make sure it's explicitly said, would your strategy be just like pick whichever one you want you want to promote, and then whichever yeah. two you don't promote, those are we promote later. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Cool. And so there's there's another advantage to it, right? That people don't always spot. And if you if you've ever heard of the ask method from Ryan Levesque, then this this really I think brings this whole thing into 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 full context because the model that he's using is segmenting, right? So you have a front end funnel that is a quiz funnel, and you use that to figure out which different benefit of your product, even if you've only got one product, which benefit is going to appeal to them, or maybe you've got multiple products and you promote different things to different people. 
And what happens, I keep seeing again and again, is those funnels don't work nearly as well as a simple, straightforward front-end funnel like a tripwire funnel or a webinar funnel. And the reason is because by having multiple different ones that you're trying to run at the same time, you split your attention and you don't do as good of a job on any of them. And therefore, you end up making less sales and, and not doing as well with it. And you make way more stress for yourself. And there's wow. these little kind of secondary factors that come in that are like, because we've run these, these types of campaigns just dozens and dozens and dozens of times, we've been able to test doing it different ways and go, huh, logically, it seems like this version should work, like segmenting more or having, you know, different promotions going out for, for where, depending on where somebody's at. Um, but in practice, it doesn't. <laughs> so then you have to go, okay, well, the world is the way it is. It's not the way I imagine it in my brain. So then you have to try and figure out why did that not work as well? And that's my best understanding is those two things, right? First of all, you get segmentation wrong and people aren't exactly where you think they are. And secondly, um, that you have split your attention and you, you end up just not doing a, as good of a job on any one of these things. And therefore it doesn't do as well. That makes so much sense. So I, I think that one of my big, maybe it, it's a strength. I think we discount the parts of us that are strengths and only look at the weaknesses. So it is a mm -hmm. strength, but something that is a big weakness for me, I have this like edge case brain where I'm always mm -hmm. like looking for all <laughs> the edge cases and I try to be yeah. so thorough and so deep. And all of my freaking promotions are just way too complicated, always. <laughs> like <laughs> I, it's all, like the biggest thing with launches for me that I had to overcome it was a big milestone. It sounds so dumb now. Is just realizing that people do not read every single email. You know, I'd almost like write it like as if everybody reads every single email and they are following so closely and giving me so much attention. And it was like a big mind opening thing where it's like, okay, well, you know, a lot of people are not paying any attention. They only read the Thursday email after four have gone out and that kind of thing. And what I love about what you're what you're talking about here is that it it kind of goes to show that the the feedback, like sometimes I'll get when we send emails of like, hey, why didn't you buy? I often get feedback where people are like, you just said too many things. I don't know what's the difference between this thing and this thing. Like, what are all these things? And it sounds like the way I've been approaching it, which is, okay, I need to make it more clear in the emails which one is for which thing, is fundamentally wrong. And what you're saying here is like this big uh, aha moment for me because if you only have one thing you're promoting, no one is going to wonder what thing is for what purpose because it's all just the same thing. Yeah. And that the way you get around this, like the fact that not everyone's interested in this thing, the way you get around it is by promoting more, which is a nice segue into the core topic of the episode. So the question I want to ask you on this segmentation note that you have, I know from a different interview of yours that I've listened to that this process you're about to teach us, this kind of like twice a month or even once a month promoting process, that you preface each promotion with relevant content. Mm -hmm. What I'm wondering is, do you use any like hand raising kind of interest in that purely value content to influence like launch message frequency or anything like that? Okay. No, no. So it's not there to find out who you should send it to. It's only there just to, you know, peak interest, prep people to buy that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So to give kind of context to this, right? So we used to run, we tested every single kind of promotion that we ever heard about from Frank Kern and Ryan Levesque and, um, you know, all the sideways sales letters and all of these different kind of things, right? And webinars and automated webinars. We tried all of them and we tracked all of them. How long did it take to do? How often did it work? What results did it get? And what we found was there were just these fundamental things that worked and we cut down from all those different tactics to the fundamental things. So then, we ran with just those fundamental things. We thought, that's it. We've done our 80-20. We've cut it down. And then within those, we were like, oh, actually, we found within that there was a whole bunch of stuff we could still cut out and simplify it down further. And we just keep cutting and cutting and cutting till you get to just this really simple, straightforward system. And then you get really good at doing that one thing. It's like the Bruce Lee quote about the 10,000. You know, I fear someone who not has done 10,000 kicks, but done one kick 10,000 times. It's like, just mm -hmm. get really good at doing the basics of it, right? So I can kind of talk you through the overall framework for that. But this is the thing that it always works. Like this never doesn't, this is never doesn't work. That's too many, that's too many uh, negatives, isn't it? This always, it always works. always does not work. <laughs> <laughs> there so, isn't a time when in the past it hasn't ever not done well. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you said you stripped it back to the 80-20, the fundamentals yeah. that worked. If you were to rapid fire those before we dive into the the like framework, what are those fundamentals that work? I've actually got them pulled up right here. So here's the 15 crucial elements of a high performing sales page. One, call out your audience. Two, have a compelling headline. Three, have a sub headline that goes into more details of a benefit. Have a clear call to action button. Pain agitation solution. Speed to results or future cast where you talk about what benefit they're going to get in their life as a whole. A meet the instructor section. Talk about the benefits of the product, not just the features. Social proof, so for example, testimonials. Go into the offer in detail for people who love that kind of thing. Talk about the bonuses that you've got. Cover the guarantee and what's going to happen if they don't like the product. Close with a reminder of a summary of everything we've gone through so far. Have frequently asked questions and have scarcity or urgency. You did it. So I told John, in we cut it out of the interview, but I told John, see if you can rattle them off in under a minute so we can make a YouTube short. And he did it. I think that was like 55 <laughs> seconds. All right. So let's let's next hear the um, the the shopping cart ones because I'm keen on those. So again, just intro with like, here are the elements. I'll make it into a short video. Perfect. So here's the six crucial elements for high-performing checkout page. Have a guarantee and make that a big badge on there. Cover three main benefits of what it is that they're buying. Have an image of the course so they feel comfortable and know they're definitely getting the thing that they were thinking of getting. Include testimonials for social proof. Have an image of the course creator that might be yourself and have a simple checkout with as few fields as possible. Sweet. Well, that was great. Appreciate those. This is a really nice reference. I'm trying to remember what even we were talking about before I like highlighted this. Um, so I guess let's backtrack a minute. So what got us onto the topic of the um, the crucial elements? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So once a month promotion with value. That's what you're starting to talk about. And yeah. um, the elements of high promoting sales page and stuff. So I guess I think this is a good time to segue then from the Black Friday stuff into this model. So maybe the framing I can give you here. Actually, sorry, I do have one more thing I want to ask before we go. So mm -hmm. you said that those Black Friday spikes and the other like twice a year spikes, they're the spikes because they're also the only things. <laughs> so if someone's doing what you're about to talk about, this like regular promoting thing, is Black Friday still always going to be the big spike? Or might it be that it's like only a little bit better and that they could be getting what they get on Black Friday pretty much, like just all the dang time? Pretty much. Yeah, so wow. Black Friday will tend to go down to about three quarters to four fifths of what it used to be because you haven't got all of that pent up demand. But there are people every month who are ready to buy and not all of them are ready to buy in November in that particular week. And so what you'll tend to see is something that is maybe half to two thirds of what you'll get in your Black Friday promotion at the moment, if that's the only promotion that you're doing every single month. Wow. Yeah. And, and if somebody- <laughs> That's cool, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's, I feel like that's, I'll mark that as a gem as well. Um, I feel like, yeah, it's pretty mind blowing, but it also makes sense. I really, something I've been trying to do. So Zach Buckler, recent podcast guest, I don't know if you know him, but he is a self-proclaimed lazy marketer. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to remind myself with this over-preparing thing, like, just be lazy. Like Zach, like, or at least be a little bit lazier. If I even if I can't sign my name under lazy, like just don't be so obsessive. And what I love about yours is it's just lazy is not quite the right word, but like simple, you know, like it's not unnecessarily complicated. It's just it's just simple. It's just simple. I love it. Uh, I know I said that last one was my final Black Friday one, but I do have one more. Suppose someone's listening like me yeah. who's like, oh, I have been doing Black Friday all wrong and I have already conditioned my email list to wait for Black Friday. What do I do? Like, how do I dig myself out of this hole? That's fine. That's all right. People forget mostly. Um, so <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. So do your Black Friday. If you, Let's say it's too late, right? You've already planned out Black Friday for this year. You've already got everything set up. Do it the way you planned it. And then next month, do one of these promotions the way that we're talking about it. And the month after, do another one. And the month after, do another one. It's and, like, so just... and, and then gradually everybody get used to it and they'll be fine. And so Black Friday moving forward. So like this year, maybe I do my big discounts. But then future Black Fridays, I just only do this like targeted bundle thing. And maybe there are people who were holding out. And then once they see that this is the new way, then they adjust. And then in the future, they just buy more regularly. Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. 
Yeah, we've got right, lots so of clients who come to us and they've done Black Friday promotions always as their main thing. And then we we gradually transition them over to this and it always works. It's fine. Cool. So now we'll transition and I'll give you that um that wrapper for this this topic. So I guess before we move into this, for the listener, this is the hook of the episode. It's essentially you're not promoting enough. And I think what really attracted me to this this hook uh, is that certainly for me, the fear is that sending, gosh, oh, I get scared even thinking of two a month, right? Like <laughs> the idea of sending twice a month, I'm like, everyone's going to hate me. Everyone's going to unsubscribe. So knowing that there's a way to do this in a value forward way, I think it's be cool. And here's the wrapper. I find whenever I write launches, I just kind of hate it. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like it's, maybe it's my ADHD, like I feel like I want the work I'm doing to feel valuable. And when I'm mm -hmm. writing something that the only job of it is to sell, it just feels like a waste of time because it's like I already wrote things last year that say basically the same thing or last month that say basically the same thing. And all these emails do, they're just me in this hamster wheel of like writing launch copy to run a launch to get sales so that I can, you know, keep revenue coming in. I, I like that your approach is a little bit more content driven, but I would be one of the things I'm wondering about is like, if I am imagining promoting twice a month, like a typical mm -hmm. course creator, I know that you don't advocate for making a bajillion products. So like maybe the way we can launch into this is suppose somebody has a thousand dollar flagship product, a membership, a $300 and maybe a tripwire mm -hmm. and then like some workshops or something. Let's say that's their product suite. What, what does this twice a month promotion look like? Do you essentially just like round robin endlessly or how do you approach it? Yeah. In that case, if you've got that number, I would say you might do one a month and you would mm. then, but there's kind of four different things we discussed there. So you probably transit, you go through them one a month and after four months you go back to the start again and that's it. And when do you, what's the threshold of like, this so it sounds like product quantity is the thing that dictates once a month versus twice a month. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And there are different ways. That, I mean, if you want to work your way around that and do two a month, what you need to start looking at is, okay, well, how am I going to bundle these up differently? Or is there going to be, okay, I've got the course plus this one comes to, comes with some group coaching I'm going to add in, or I'm going to sell mine alongside my, my buddy Bob's course, you know, that actually fits really well with me, or I'm going to do an affiliate promotion for somebody else's course. That's another way, of course, of, um, promoting more products. If you, if you have some other people who promote things that are maybe tangential to yours, you know, they're appropriate to your audience, but they're not a topic that you cover. You know, let's say you cover filming and lighting and you've got somebody else who covers um, how to grow a YouTube channel. And then it's like, great, the filming and lighting is essential. And the growing YouTube channel is like, how do you do hooks and titles and thumbnails and all this kind of thing is exactly for that same audience of YouTubers, but it's not something that you cover in your content. And that can work really well as well. There's a bunch of like, ways of doing that. You can also bundle stuff together and then split it out into smaller set into smaller um, amounts, you know, take, okay, I've got my thousand dollar course, but I'm actually going to take out two of the modules that this is the things that some people only want to learn about these two things. And I'm going to sell that separately, or I'm going to take all of my smaller products and bundle them together. That's, these are lots of different ways to increase the number, but the simple thing, what I want to do, what I want to try and do is just get people to start doing a regular monthly promotion. So what I'm looking at is what's the simplest way to get started with that. And it's not to figure out what's the ideal product suite. It's to just say, right, what could we do with what you've already got? So if you've got four different products, cool, do a promotion each month for one or four products and month five, start again back at the beginning. That makes sense. So let's talk about the framework then. So I'm trying to think of how to segue into it. Like, I guess that what I always wonder about is the ideal content cadence. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say that we are, let's just, well, you work with a lot of clients. So for a typical course creator who's like, you know, low six figures, would you say that this four product suite is probably the kind of catch all that's relevant for most people? Or what do you, what do you think yeah, is it's about right? People have, we see have tend to have somewhere between like two and sometimes, you know, the, the high end is like six to 10. So three or four products is, is reasonably normal. Yeah. And maybe as we talk about this, we should also say like, what if somebody only has a flagship course? Maybe mm -hmm. we talk about like permutations for that. Cause I'm thinking of one client of mine who has only 
a thirteen hundred dollar course, and that's like the only thing you can buy from her, and it's cohort cohort based and stuff. But let's say typical suite for products. So, what's your ideal content cadence like if they're doing one launch a month? Is it one value email a week, and then you go into launch week, or wh what would you love to see someone doing? Yeah, so you have two weeks that are part of the promotion for the course, and that is not all promotional emails, but they're all part of a sequence that goes together. And then the other two weeks of the month, you want to be doing some useful content, send out your YouTube videos as you publish them via email, send out your podcast episodes, send out your blog posts, etc. That kind of thing, just send out useful content that you're already creating so that people feel like, oh great, this is helpful and I like being on this email list and this is useful. But then you've got your promotional period, so it's two weeks. The first week, you don't mention the course at all, but the emails that you send are emails about the topic that the course is about. So that all the people who are interested in that topic are now paying more attention to your emails. They're feeling better about you because you've been providing useful content to them. They feel that you are an authority in the space because they see that you know what you're talking about as you're sending these emails out. So that first week, they've got a particular, there's, there's a simple version of this, which is just send out three useful content emails in that week about that topic. The advanced version is something called pain agitation solution. So the idea here is your pain email is about the problem that the people are facing that your course is going to solve. And you're trying to explain the pain to them in more detail than they are able to explain it themselves. You're trying to help them understand the problem that they have. Understanding your problem is a very valuable thing to do. If you actually understand what problem you've got really clearly, you're much closer to solving it. And so we're trying to help people understand what their current situation is. And then we finish that one by saying in tomorrow's email or Wednesday's email, we're going to cover more detail about this and what, how this is affecting your life in ways you might not even have realized. And then the second email, the agitation one, we're talking about not just the problem, but then how that affects the rest of their life. And the value there is it's making them realize why they need to take action on this. Now, you understand this so much better than any individual person does themselves because you deal with tens or hundreds or thousands of people who are all dealing with this same problem. So you know more about this than they do. And you can then help them understand that situation. And then at the end of that email you send tomorrow, we're going to cover some quick tips on how you can solve this. And you take a solution that's in your course, a small tip, something that's going to take like 15 minutes to solve, to deal with. And it's going to give, it's going to solve a tiny bit of that problem for them. And then you teach that to them. And that is your solution email. And the end of that one, you say, next week, we're going to be talking about our course, which is going to allow you to solve this in so much more detail and allow you to achieve way more. But you're still not actually linking to the course sales page. They can't go buy the course at a discount. This is just all set up. So that's the advanced version of it. Then we move into the promotion week, and now the course is available for a discount. You're getting 30% off as a normal amount. In these emails, you're going to be linking through to the sales page and reminding people that they're able to get that discount for a limited period of time till Friday. Now, we're going to gain logic fear going, going, gone. This is the email sequence for this week. One email a day and two on the Friday. So gain is about how is someone's life going to be materially better once they have fixed this, once they've solved this problem, they've bought the course, they've solved the issue. Even if they don't buy the course, we want them to get value from this email because they understand, oh, if I solve this problem, whether by buying this course or some other mo method, this is how it's going to actually impact my life. And you've had testimonials from your clients, you've had case studies, you've seen how this works. You can help them understand what the future of their life could be. And a way of doing this email that I think is really nice is future casting. And a future casting is talking about how's your life going to be different in a day, a week, a month, three months, six months, a year, and helping them see what that future is going to be because they can't see that. That's not obvious to them. Second one is logic. Gain logic fear we're doing here. Logic is getting into the details, the numbers, exactly what is it that you can use from a statistical point of view, from an analysis, analytical point of view. This is to help people who really think about the world through data and numbers and facts and figures, that kind of thing. And you're laying out why they should be solving that problem. You are not specifically selling your course. You're specifically selling, you should solve this problem and here's why and here's why it matters. And then at the end, you link to the course and you say it's available 30% off this week. 
The fear one is now getting into people who see the negative side of things and want to move away from negative rather than towards positive. And we've all got this a little bit, but it's to some people this is very much their decision-making framework. And so here you're talking about all the things that if they don't solve this problem, it's going to cause us issues in their life in the future. And this is kind of connected to that agitation one that we had before. So that's gain logic fear. And all of these we're mentioning that the course is on discount. Then we get into the last emails, the going, going, gone. These ones are much more standard promotional, but we're still trying to provide as much value as we can so that even if someone doesn't buy this time, they still appreciate getting these emails. Case studies, testimonials, get into frequently asked questions. And the frequently asked questions email can be very long because it might be all of the questions someone has. No one's going to read every single answer, but they're going to read the ones that they're interested in. And here you're really hammering it. The discount's going to end in 24 hours, six hours. This is going like it's going in like two hours time. So that over the course of those three days when that's going out, they can see, yes, I really need to take action on this now. So those ones are more, much more promotional, but actually six out of the nine emails are really value-based. And this matters because 90% of people are probably never going to buy from you, but you want to provide value to them because you like helping people. You want people to solve this problem. 10% are going to buy from you at some point, but only if they stay on your email list. So we would need to provide enough value in every email to keep them on there. But what's happening is we're providing value that moves people towards a sale. So we're doing both things at once and layering those together. And what happens when you start doing these kind of promotions is you will start to see, you get emails from people saying, oh my God, these emails are so helpful. I really appreciate you sending this out to me. Um, and they love getting them. And your unsubscribe rates often will go down rather than up because you've got these kind of things in place. This is great, by the way. I love this. And I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack and spell it out. But this is like I love that you're giving us like a mini course on an effective launch. It's awesome. Uh one one little thing to get your take on. I think it was Rye Schwartz from Copy Hackers who I heard it from that he doesn't like to push like he doesn't show countdown timers or anything until the final forty eight hours. He doesn't push that like urgency until final forty eight. Do you you're you're on board with that. We do them the whole way through. We do okay. countdown timers from uh, from the beginning of that week, so it's over the course of the five days. Uh, we tried them in the emails, and if you do them in the emails, it does help. It gives about a seven percent boost. We we ran a bunch of different tests on them, and about seven percent boost to sales. But if you have them on the sales page versus not having them, it's a massive increase. Like it's a huge, huge increase having them there. I haven't tried just having them for 48 hours versus having them for the whole week. Mm. Um, but I know that having them is a really big deal. Deadline funnel okay. is the best system for using for for doing that. Yeah. Well, if you ever do the test, tell me, because I think that the logic was that if you do a countdown timer on like card open email, people mm -hmm. will be like, oh, I've got seven days. I can decide later. Like that was, <laughs> that was the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Cool. Well, I want to dig into this. So one one thing that's probably a limiting belief system on my part. So let's recap this for everyone. So basically, gain logic fear first. So this is three emails in week one before card even opens. No, uh, pain agitation solution. Oh, so, so sorry, one. sorry. Yeah, pain. <laughs> yeah. Let me scroll up in my notes. Pain agitation solution. So given that it's three emails over that mm -hmm. first week, is it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday? What do you like for these? We normally do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm pr pretty sure it doesn't matter all that much. But yeah, we do one Monday, Wednesday, Friday as standard. Okay. Uh, and then for the promo week, which I misquoted a second ago, promo week is now the gain, logic, fear, going, mm -hmm. going, gone. So Monday gain, Tuesday logic, Wednesday fear, and then Thursday one going, Friday, well, sorry, Thursday one going, and then Friday a going, and Friday a gone. That's essentially mm -hmm. the breakdown. Okay. Yeah. So something I like is you talking about the value delivery, but the thing that is maybe the limiting belief system is it's like, if we're looking at these, so the pain agitation solution, I don't know. I just, I would feel like if I'm writing an email that all it does, maybe it's because I am a marketer and I know the strategic value, you know, but like, I feel like if I write an, an email and all I do is I paint the pain, but I don't mm -hmm. actually, like I open the loop, but I don't close it. It doesn't feel like that's valuable to me. Mm. Like if I read that and all I'm like, well, yeah, it does suck. I know it sucks. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that would seem valuable. Yeah, if what, all what you did there? was send that email, I think it would be terrible. So I went to a really um, interesting talk at Hammersmith Apollo in London recently from Esther Perel about relationships. And her whole talk was about the pain and then and about the agitation. And then there wasn't a solution section. I was like, 
hire me what? for this blues thing. Does yeah. I just feel bad now? This yeah. is no good. <laughs> so the pain on its own is no use, but you're setting it up as a series of three emails. And like we've talked before, not everyone's going to read every email that you've got, but it is useful in context. Okay. If you offer someone solution without defining what the problem was that it's a solution to, it actually doesn't fit very well in the human brain. Right. So, so you see there's a lot of times on sales pages that people will talk about the solution, be like, well, what problem, yeah. as, a, as the reader, what problem are you actually solving? Because I don't know if I have that problem. And as the reader of this series of emails, if you define the problem and the person goes, no, that's not me, well, then they can just not worry about the rest of it. This isn't really relevant to them. But if they're reading and they're like, oh my God, it's like you're in my head. It's like you've read my journal of all of the stuff that bothers me the most. You understand what keeps me up at night. You get me. They're now engaged. They want to now read that next email about the agitation. They want to read the email about the solution. They want to then hear about the course. So it's an important element within context. But on its own, you're right. It's not, it's not providing value unless you follow it up with the other ones. And so with that said, do you tell them in email one that like they are in this like mini series yeah. and that on Friday they'll yeah. hear the solution? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, email it's about one. an open loop in these. Yeah. Okay. Email one, you mentioned that you set it up tomorrow. We're going to show you how it affects their life. But also it's saying like this week, we're going to talk about this problem and how to solve it. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah that's it. All right. So let's talk about the scope of that pain email and how it actually frames the series. So when you're sending the first one, we've established that we, we don't want to just open the loop because that wouldn't be valuable. We need to tell them, hey, we're opening it, but we will soon close it. But we're we're now in a thing. We're in a series. So uh, John, we just paused and John pulled up a campaign he's running for a client and he's going to give us some examples. So so John, how do you frame this whole series in that first pain email? Yeah, the pain email is super straightforward. We're talking here like five or six paragraphs, something like that. Each one, maybe just a couple of sentences. And all we're saying is this is the problem that we're going to be discussing this week. And you might talk about how you first learned about this problem or your how long you've been solving this problem with people. Then you tell them what the problem is and you explain that in a little bit more detail. You say, I see that people struggle with this in this way, this way, and this way. Bring those to life. And you know what those things are already. You've already got that. And then you tell them, I'm going to give you some useful tips this week where we're actually going to solve this. And that's it. Look out for my email tomorrow and we're going to be talking about how to solve that. Cool. And then the and agitation, oh, sorry. I was just going to say for the listener, uh, it sounds like on this theme of Black Friday, you can run this just the same way for Black Friday. So if we wanted to, Black Friday is in from when this episode comes out. If it comes out on Monday, I guess it would be, we'd have to start running this pre-launch, I think this week on the day of this episode coming out. But like, that's what you could do the week before, the week before the Black Friday week, you could do this three email pre-launch, then Black Friday week, it would, it would be all these same emails, except cart close wouldn't be Friday, it would be Monday, probably, unless we do your downsell thing, in which case it might be Friday and then Monday would have a standalone offer. Is that, how would you do it if you're doing those? Would you do two weeks and then Monday would be its own downsell thing? Yeah, I mean, that's the ideal because what happens is you always see that you get a huge majority of the sales on the last day when there's all of the urgency to take action right then. And so I think if you have closed cart and then open cart and closed cart again, that is the ideal if you have time mm. to do it. If you don't, it's fine. You know, cool. just do Black Friday and don't worry about Cyber Monday. It's like you've just got to decide what your priorities are. I'm going to do it. I'll report back to you with how it went because nice. any success I have, it's all John's, John's success. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So that's really great. I love that. Very simple for the pain thing. Would you maybe throw in like a case, like you could frame this all within a story of a specific person or would it always be like, you could influence you could you. i mean okay. that's kind of makes it a little more complex to write but you could tell mm. say here's a problem that i see for example one of my students james has been going through this recently and here's here's how that has come up for him you might have been experiencing something similarly uh we're going to be looking this week at how to solve this problem um so watch out for my email tomorrow cool and you know if james ended up being a success story it'd be pretty sick if this whole week was actually showing James's pain, James's agitation, James's solution, but indeed advanced. So let's talk about the agitation one. So now that the, the pain is framed, something key I think that John said is like, it sounds like you're not framing the next two weeks as being about this thing you're just saying this week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. The point of this is these series of emails over the course of this week should be valuable on their own. We're trying to make sure that this isn't just about the course. This is serving your audience 
and moving people into the right frame of mind where they'd be ready to buy the course. We're not trying to promote the course this week. So cool. the agitation email is telling people then, okay, so that problem that we talked about yesterday, here's one of the ways that this comes up for people. I talked earlier about like, here's how it is manifested within your life as a whole. Let's kind of just pull this down and make this like as simple and straightforward as possible. Here's a way that people normally try and solve this problem. You might have tried to solve this problem through, uh, let's say it's learning a language, right? And you've got a system where you teach people learning languages through stories. And you might say, well, you might have tried Duolingo before and you just tried learning lists of vocabulary and it didn't really work for you. And I see that all the time. That's a real problem that people have. And the reason that doesn't work is because that's actually not how the human mind works. We learn through stories and stories are a really big deal. And then you can move into a tip. And actually the, the sequence I pulled up here from my copywriter has gone straight into a tip in that second email. So making that second email as valuable as possible. And so there you might say, what about watching TV shows as a way of learning that? So for example, I've, this is uh, not in the email sequence, but I've got a friend who's learning Norwegian and she's learning it by watching Peppa Pig. And she's like, you know, 42. Peppa Pig is not really her thing, but it's kind of a fun, easy story-based kid, you know, aimed at kids way of uh, learning the learning the language. And uh, plus she gets to talk about Peppa Pig with her, her nieces and nephews who love that kind of thing, right? <laughs> so you might bring that up as that could be your tip, right? So you've got some, whatever your tips are. So I've got a friend, Dolly Richards, who runs a story-based language learning um, courses where he teaches people how to learn through through stories. And so he's published a series of different uh, books, but you might also watch a TV show with the um, with the subtitles on or dubbed into that language, a TV show that you already know in one language. You know, so there's lots of different ways that you might do that. And you bring that up as a little tip of something that somebody might do. And you explain why it's a good idea. And then you say, tomorrow, I'm going to come back with another tip. And then that solution one that we've got on the last day is another tip. So as you've already got these, right? You've got these tips in your course. You already know what all of these are. You're just trying to pull out something small that you could explain in not very much time. And these emails are not massively long. This the, the, the agitation one that I mentioned just looking through here, it's probably about like 200 words, something like that. And the solution one is maybe like 300, something along that kind of lines. And so in the solution one, we're again giving somebody another tip. And then we're saying, if you are interested in solving this in more detail, I've got a lot of free content on this, but I'm also got a course and I'm going to be talking about that next week and giving you a discount on that as well. And when you do each of these emails, so like when you say yesterday we talked about blank, do you link to the like hosted web page version of the email? We don't, but that's a really interesting idea. No, we don't. Okay. <laughs> then the next question. <laughs> Maybe we will in the future. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And then um question on these tips. Uh should the the tip, like I'm thinking about it, like let's say the dog training one. So, or if you've got a course that's advanced, like let's say you were putting on a course for data-driven marketing and it was like the course of how to create a good tripwire funnel, right? Like uh -huh. it's you can't just say, hey, go make your trip, like go make your sales page on Thrivecart and add a bump or whatever. Like if they don't have one yet, like it's, too, it would be valuable, but it's too big of a scope. It's beyond the 15 minutes. Like, are you trying to get them actually a like quote win that does solve the problem? Or are you trying to get them like a good idea? Like what's the spectrum of oh, value yeah. and it's, implementability? It's the idea. It's, it's an idea okay. that you can solve easily. I mean, if, if they could go do something and get a result really quickly, then brilliant. But I don't know, you may or may not be able to pull something out like that. I'll give an ex another example of how a, a friend is doing this. That's not maybe, um, it's not perfect, but the, the the perfect is the enemy of done here. Perfect is the enemy of good because sometimes people want everything to be perfect and they don't end up doing it. I'd much rather you ran a promotion this month with what you could do and then another promotion next month and then make it a little better and not next, another one the next month. So I've got a friend, she runs another different kind of language learning course and it's about grammar. It's called Perfect English Grammar. And in there, what she sends out as the useful emails in the build up week is a tiny tip from in one of her courses where it's like a, a little quiz. So you have the question at the beginning and then there's like 20 lines of empty space and then there's the answer at the bottom and you get to go through, try and see if you can figure it out. And if not, it gives you the answer and explains why that thing is the, is the correct answer to give on that one. And that's her way of giving something that people can actually do that thing straight away. That's great. That's cool. That's a really nice way of doing it. Or you could pull out something that's a tip that somebody goes, oh, great, I could do that, yeah. And they may or may not actually go and implement it, but you manage to explain it quite easily. They're all fine. 
like don't get caught up and this must be the absolute perfect one we're just trying to get something that people are like they appreciate having had the tip from you what you've told them if they do it is going to be useful and will work and then they appreciate the help that they got and they see you as an authority because you know what you're talking about cool yeah that's awesome this is a really really good framework i feel like the promo week we don't i'm looking at the time we have left i feel like promo week we've got enough enough down i don't think we need to zoom into it too much more um one thing i want to ask though so it sounds like the biggest kpi here that i'm pulling from this interview is like it's what you said a minute ago like just email every month like mm -hmm. if you're gonna take one thing from today it's that yeah so if let's say someone's doing the once a month they're gonna do this two week promo period and it's thematic and then two weeks of value when it's like the the off time do you have like a good cadence of content to aim for for those two weeks that are non-promo like once a week twice a week emails like what do you go for yeah well one or two a week that seems that seems pretty reasonable we've got clients who already are sending out an email every day and they've already got content going out all the time in which case cool great keep doing that otherwise one or two emails a week is fine the most cool. important thing is it's something that you can just constantly do you know that you don't start doing it and you get burnt out because there's too many tasks on your list yeah that's cool I, I recently surveyed our list to say like, hey, because I like making videos. I find video easier. Uh, but I sent an email and I was like, hey, do you like these video emails or do you prefer text? And like overwhelmingly, people prefer text. And I was like, fuck. So now I kind of feel like I have to make the text emails, but <laughs> it's coming at the you cost gotta... <laughs> of actually making text emails. So you're gonna have to yeah. lie to everybody and say, oh, you all wanted video emails. So <laughs> just insect them with the idea. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't listen to any of you because he said you wanted text, and I just don't like it. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so the thing I am the the like outstanding question for me is I imagine implementing this. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sounds like the the two weeks useful content you said YouTube videos, podcasts, blog posts. It sounds like it doesn't matter what they're on, just random whatever you're making. Yeah. Cool. So let's say we've done the cycle. Let's say I've got my four products, uh, and I'm cycling through, and now we're back to our dog training course. Uh, this is where I get stuck because I feel like I gotta like say the same crap as before, but in a different way. So mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you try to find some fundamentally different angle? Like we talked about puppies and now we're gonna talk about old dogs this time, or like what do you do when you cycle back? So there's two different ways that you can do it. One is you can just send the same emails again. <laughs> like just and I'm gonna and paste. explain, I'm gonna explain why that's okay <laughs> and give you some examples about it, right? So I know people who do this. This isn't what we do with our clients, but this is totally possible. So I've got a friend who runs a digital painting company. It's called, no, I'm not going to say the name actually, because I'm going to explain some behind the scenes. So digital painting company. And there were two guys and they were running it. And one of them was this marketing like genius who really loved getting into the details of it. And every time that he ran a new launch, they did this through launches rather than the kind of promotions we do. They do like three a year. Every time he would tweak it and change it and refine it and add something different in. And the other guy is loves digital painting and is not that fussed about marketing. And they they split up the partnership. And the one who just loves the painting, he just has run exactly the same launch every single time, every four months for the last four years. And it still works because most people didn't read the previous. Most people didn't open the previous emails. You've got some people who weren't even on your email list, so that it doesn't matter to them. The ones who are on your email list, most of them didn't open your emails. The ones who opened them, most of them didn't read them. If they read them, most of them weren't really paying very much attention. And then most of the ones who were paying attention didn't click through to the sales page. So that definitely doesn't matter. That can definitely be the same. And then they didn't go to the checkout page. And such a tiny percentage of them each time buy. Nine, like on average, and a really, really good promotion, about 0.5% of your email list will buy. But that's enough if you have a big email list to make a lot of money. So... That's one way of doing it. The other way is to look at a different hook each time. And this is what we're doing with our clients is looking at all the previous emails and go, which ones were opened the most, which ones were clicked through the most, which ones do people like, what can I take from that? And then find a different hook. So for example, let's say you're selling a course about self-love. You're looking for like, what is there in the news at the moment? Or what is there in the general, um, it's what time of year is it that might tie into that? Maybe it's new year. And there's something around a lot of people in New Year get depressed because Christmas has finished and um, they don't have any money left and it's still winter and it's dark and what have you. And self-love is more important now than ever. And then you go into an angle around that. Or 
the Olympics is happening. And so we're talking about, you know, you, it's really tempting with the Olympics going on to start comparing ourselves to these elite athletes, looking at them and thinking, oh my goodness, I've not accomplished something at that level. But you know what? It's really important that we appreciate what we have done in our life and have love for ourselves. And then you go in from that angle and you have a series of emails. But whichever way you go, I really feel like there are, after a certain amount of time, you can start reusing the emails. You know, maybe it's not four months, but maybe it's a year. And yeah. you maybe take last year's sequence, you go, you know what, I'm going to tweak it a little bit. Or actually this month I don't have time, but I'm still just, I'm just going to send out the last year's sequence exactly as it was. Or no, I'm going to completely rewrite this one because I've got more time to do that and I really, really want to. I'd say about once a year, you can really start to go back and, and just reuse what you've done before. I love that. I, I love that you said it because it's like, I've been wanting to do this and this is something I wanted to ask you about today. It's like <clears throat> all the money to or time to like re-engineer a campaign, does it does it get paid off by extra performance? And it sounds like maybe no, unless you're really, really big or something. Um, mm. What I'm wondering, so, so yeah, I'm going to go off and just run the same campaign with maybe a couple of tweaks, but, but it's cool to think that you can maybe just have the four for the year and recycle those each year. I ran the numbers for a client whose launches I run, and mm -hmm. on average, 50% of purchases come from people who join the email list within like 30 days or 60 days or something like that. So what you're saying really makes sense because yes, the aggregate value of the list is that you do get people from like five years ago who bought. But the fact is, there are way more people who bought more than 30 days ago than 30 days or less ago, always. And so like, in other words, <laughs> someone who, yeah. sorry, someone who joined the email <laughs> list 30 days or less ago is like a small slice of a big list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like there are way less people who are currently alive than who are dead from all time ever. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a bit morbid for the conversation. But <laughs> um, <laughs> so the question I'd have for you is like, again, with simplicity, I think I know what your answer is going to be. But do you think, because like on my email list, we have a lot of complexity. My business partner mm -hmm. is Brennan Dunn, if you know him. So we've got a yeah, lot of. Yeah, when you said double your freelancing, I was like, oh. That's yeah. Brennan's course, unless you've got yeah. one exactly the same name. Yeah, yeah, I, know, yeah I know Brennan, Brennan a tiny bit. We've messaged okay. like three or four times. Yeah. So he's the email personalization guy for yeah. reference. So the context here, they're like two, two opposite ends. And so we have a lot of complexity <laughs> going on. Um, but the complexity can be a burden sometimes. And so right now we have a lot of stuff where like when someone joins the email list, we add a custom field that's like the lock status. We mark them as locked. We unlock them once they've received an evergreen promotion so they don't get like things at the same time, this kind of thing. Um, we have like a lot of automations. We rarely send broadcasts. Pretty much everything comes from an automation. But like when I'm thinking of what you're doing here, I'm wondering, do you just like send quote dumb broadcasts? Just whole list, everyone gets these content emails as a broadcast always. And then the two week period comes in whole list, everyone gets these like two week launch sequence. Like what what's your level of complexity versus simplicity? Yeah. So we have like maybe a two week welcome sequence. And at the end of that, everyone just goes into the full list that gets everything. Now, there's a few reasons why this matters, why this works in my in my belief, right? This is my understanding of the world. What I've done is done the thing, tried it both ways, seen what worked, and then tried to figure out why it worked rather than like knowing this for certain. When you have a whole load of automations, you have a whole load of things that can go wrong. And the thing I found with automations is they do love to go wrong. And they you change do. one little thing and something <laughs> else breaks and it's a nuisance yeah. and people don't get the emails they were supposed to get. So that's yeah. one problem. So you've got all the work of fixing that and you've got the fact that some people aren't going to be getting the right email. So recently, for example, a friend of mine who's running a course business, um, she set up a new tag that people were getting when they signed up to a new version of the discount. And it's called something similar to the previous tags because the clients, the customers actually see the tag when mm. they're getting, uh, when they're logging into Teachable. So they see that, so it needs to be something that makes sense to them. And so they're called something similar to each other and one her assistant set it up with the wrong tag. And then a whole bunch of people just weren't getting the emails for their welcome sequence Lovely. after they bought the course, yeah. right? So not just not getting promotional emails, they weren't getting the ah, consumption emails, which triggering. is like, this is, yeah, this is not good, right? So the simpler we can get it, the less automations, yeah. the less chance of something going wrong. So that's one part. The second part is when you do a promotion, to the whole list, you get all this data in in one go. 
And what I see from the way, just a certain cadence to this, a certain way the human brain works, when you get all of that data in in one go, it's possible to go through it, analyze it, make sense of it, do something better the next time. Much, much, much more easily than if you look every six months at your automation and go, right, how did that sequence do over the last six months? What are we going to change about the upcoming ones? And yeah. we see the improvements that we make because of that being bigger than the advantages of doing it the other way. Yeah. Now, this is our system. I'm not saying this is the only way. I'm not saying like this is absolutely the right way, but it's what we've tried and it's what we've actually found in the real world to kind of work for us. And it sounds like, at least for me personally, where and anyone who's feeling like a, the burden of automation complexity, like mm -hmm. I have a lot of really complex apps that I do not touch because I know if I touch them, they will break. I have a <laughs> lot of email automations that I do not touch. And uh, if someone's feeling the weight of this and it's causing them to not take action, maybe that's the sign. Like if you have complexity and you're tracking all your data and you can show like, hey, I'm doing this, I'm staying active and it's making me money. Cool, keep doing it. But if you're like me, we're like, ooh, I just, oh God, it's so much freaking effort. Then maybe that's when it's the sign to consider simplicity, which again, I'm giving myself permission to lean into simplicity after this combo. So I'll ask you one little point and then we'll wrap up since we're at time. Uh, if we're doing any of these two week promos, including even Black Friday, and tell me if you think there's an exclusion for Black Friday, uh, would you say that basically your air quotes launch segment, and presumably this is the case for your regular value emails too, is just everyone minus people who signed up less than two weeks ago, or everyone minus people who've gone through onboarding or haven't gone well, through. Well, also minus people who've bought the course before. Of course, yeah. Yeah, apart from that, yes. Cool. I feel like there's a whole conversation that I wish we had time for of like, I always fear that when I sell a bundle, people who bought one of the products, they'll want a discount and that adds like a lot of complexity. Do you have a hot take on how you like to approach that? Say it again, people who bought oh, so a bundle and then there's an individual product within it. Yeah, I don't know. There probably is a system that we've got in the business around that and I don't know what it is. I haven't <laughs> been in that level of detail, so okay. I can't answer it very well. Cool. But, um, but it sounds like you do your two week welcome sequence, Probably, can someone find something on your podcast about how you like to do welcome sequences? Yeah, so episode 69 of the Art of Selling Online Courses is with Kyle Jordan, who's one of our copywriters, and he specializes in welcome sequence. It's called How to Convert Prospects into Buyers Using Email Onboarding, episode 69 of the Art of Selling Online Courses. Awesome. So someone signs up, they go through that. While they're in it, they don't get your regular old YouTube videos, podcast emails. They just get only the welcome sequence. Then once they're done, they get whatever. And even if that means they finished halfway in to your current launch, they'll still get that current launch. Oh, great question. Maybe yeah, that. We can I don't know, that actually. We, can I, we don't need to educate <laughs> Zach here. The listener can decide for themselves what they want to do. Because I guess it is that thing. It's complex. Like, I would add a lot of complexity to make sure, oh, are we already in the launch? Do all this shit to mark them as an active launch? But anyway, I think that's a can of worms. But um, but certainly John's reaction of like, oh, well, yeah, that actually is worth thinking about, says maybe it's worth thinking about. Uh, but I think for today, we'll get it to a close. But before I close it up, is there anything you wish I'd asked or anything you didn't get a chance to share on this whole note that you want to really be sure to to share with us? Can I give people some benchmark numbers for this really quickly? And I would love that. Step? Yeah. Okay. Because this took us a lot of figuring out. Yeah, I love benchmark metrics, right. and let's let's tee them up where we can like chop them into YouTube Shorts easily. So give okay. each one a headline. A good conversion rate for your email list to number of buyers in every promotional sequence is 0.3 percent. A good conversion rate from sales page through to checkout page is 20%. A good conversion from checkout page to sale is somewhere between about 20 and 50%. 20% is normal, totally normal. 50% is excellent. A good conversion rate for your order bumps is between 20 and 50% of people who buy the main product then also buying the order bump. A good conversion rate for your upsell is between 10 and 20%. So overall, what we see is 0.3% of people who are on your email list buying something from you if you do all of these stages really well. That's awesome. And for you, the listener, like to dive deeper, again, that episode I mentioned at the beginning about the uh, the tripwire funnel, really sick to build on this. Um, cool. Anything else you want to share before we go? No, that's it. I mean, like the the I've mentioned the the podcast, the art of selling online courses. 
if you guys are interested, if anybody's interested in getting in touch and you think we might be a good fit to work together, we're super picky about who we work with. But if we are not a good fit, we are going to be super friendly and helpful and send you useful resources that will help you. Um, you can go to datadrivenmarketing.co and just click book a call and that will allow you to book a quick call with us, see if we're a good fit. Um, and if you want a free review of your funnel as it currently is, you can go to pimpyourfunnel.com. And there, if you fill in and answer a bunch of questions, what we're going to do is send you a report that is going to tell you these are the steps that you're currently missing. This is how much more money you could make if you had those steps in place. And here's some free training that is going to allow you to actually go and implement that. And as I understand it, you guys also have like an AI coach that was like trained on all of your content or something, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's built on top of ChatGPT and we used a system that allowed us to add all of the information from all of our coaches' coaching calls. And if you go to datadrivenmarketing.ai, then you can access that for free. Awesome. Well, this was so, so great. I feel like I've written about 50 homework assignments. I want to go research <laughs> on the Art of Selling Online Course podcast. So thanks so much for being here, John. I'll hit stop, but we do not disconnect because it's Riverside. And uh, thanks so much for being here, listener. Thanks so much for being here, John. See ya. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Zach. What a great episode, eh? I know I always say that, but this one, really great episode. I think one of my favs. I would say my fav, but... If you're a guest and you're listening, your episode was my fav, but this one, this one was pretty close. So um, anyway, here are my top favorite moments and top takeaways from the interview. Takeaway number one, you should be running an email promotion to your list every month following the value forward format that John explains in the full episode. And for some of his clients, they run them twice a month. But because of the structure, they're able to run these very, very frequent, like it sounds scary to me, email list once a month, everyone's going to unsubscribe. Oh my God. But because of the structure and the format, people actually find that emails valuable. And you don't get this crazy huge unsubscribe rate. You don't churn through your list. Like everyone's happy. Um, he has a two week launch structure that he proposes for every course creator. So if you're doing it once a month as a starting point, you would just do this two weeks once. And then the other two weeks would just be regular old content. If you're doing it twice a month, you basically just like keep these things running back to back. We go into it more in the full interview. But I'm going to give you the lowdown right now. So one week is pre-launch. It has three emails. Monday, the email is the pain email. Wednesday, it's the agitation email. Friday, it's the solution email. Go to the interview to learn how to structure these. Launch week on Monday, you have gain. Tuesday, you have logic. Wednesday, you have fear. Thursday, you have going. Friday, you have going. Friday, you have gone. That's the structure for a two-week launch campaign that people love that can like 5x your revenue really quickly. Takeaway number two, keep your email funnels and automations simple to support you in that number one goal of running a promotion every month. If you have complexity and you feel the weight and burden of that complexity like me and it's keeping you from that number one goal of running your promotions regularly, that's probably a sign you should simplify. Takeaway number three, your launches need to have a deadline, aka urgency, and an incentive to buy now versus buying another time. In John's experience, usually a 30% discount during a one-week launch window is sufficient to get both of these boxes ticked. You can find the video transcript highlights and links from today's episode in the show notes at ftcreator.com forward slash episode 12. That's the word episode and then the number 12. It's like one, two. If you enjoyed this, please leave a good review. I'd really appreciate it. it. Helps me create more stuff like this and helps me know what you like. Thanks for being here and I'll see you in the next one.